20% over the last 20 years, so it's pretty good, right? That, that's so good. So cancer that's doctors are doing their work, right? Yeah, but... Hey, I'm going to pat myself on the back. Oh, my arm doesn't reach that far. But, okay, cancer deaths have reduced by 20% in the last 20 years. So just because you have cancer doesn't mean you're going to die. So that's a fallacy, fallacy number one. You're not necessarily going to die if you have cancer. You may die if something stupid happens, like the man we spoke about before, thought his doctor thought he had hemorrhoids, he had cancer. Yeah, that's really bad news, and uh, we're fighting against that. But we're also fighting against these misconceptions. Now, in the United States, this year, there's expected to be about 1.6 million cases of cancer and about 600,000 deaths. So... About a million people will actually survive their cancer, and about 600,000, sadly, will die of their cancer. Now, there's about 338,000 cases of the genital system. Now, genital system involves the... Um, the kidneys? Well, the, actually... That's oh, urological. That's urological, but they included that. So there's, they included 140,000 of the kidney system, the urinary system, so that's the bladders, the ureters with about 30,000 deaths. In men, cancers of the lung, prostate, and bronchus, colorectum, account for 50% of all the cancer diagnoses. So think about prostate, lung, and colorectal in men are the most important ones. And prostate cancer accounts for 233,000 prostate cancers. That's a lot. That's a, that's a huge 233,000, okay? Now, the incidence varies. In Arizona, it's 112 uh, rate versus Washington, D.C., which is 194 rate, almost twice the difference. And it probably has to do with racial uh, differences. Now, there's more blacks in Washington, D.C., and we know blacks have a higher rate of prostate cancer and a higher rate of death. In fact, there's twice the mortality in black men than white men from prostate cancer. Do we know why? Yeah, it's all due to delay in diagnosis. Men are told, and then for some reason, there's a delay in treatment. So if you're being told you have a high PSA, you should work on it. You don't have endless time to think, 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 especially when you know that there's tens of thousands of deaths from prostate cancer. Now, death rate from prostate cancer is down by 45% from the peak, and the peak was obviously in the years before PSA, PS, PSA and early testing. detection. In the old days, when men were diagnosed with prostate cancer, usually they came in the hospital with back pain. They had a prostate biopsy. They found the prostate cancer and the metastasis simultaneously. So it's a little late. That's when I went to medical school. So a very common diagnosis, man with back pain, terrible back pain, abnormal x-rays, do a rectal exam, find an enlarged prostate, do the biopsy, make the diagnosis of an incurable cancer. And how are they found now? Now, men are being evaluated routinely with PSAs. They're being diagnosed before the cancer spreads. If a man comes to us with, say, PSA 6, Gleason 6, Gleason is how the cancer looks under the microscope. Actually, our success rate, cancer-free survival, is around 97% for that man. And you don't have to be cut on. Most men keep their sexual function, their urinary function. They avoid radical prostatectomy, and we have great data showing improvement in survival and cancer-free survival. Now, you're looking at prostate cancer patients treated sometimes more than 20 years ago. You're updating the data, right? Yeah, we have a huge database. So we have a huge database. We follow the patients, and the big thing about us is... We follow the patients. We know the data. We know what's going to happen to you. Now, you've been at a variety of hospitals, some that treat tens of thousands of patients, right, over tens of decades. Thousands, yes. And? Well, they don't keep their data. They don't keep their data. So it's really great to have our data, to follow the data. And if you want to know what type of patient does, you just type it in and we can see wh- how they do, right. how that or, type of cancer is doing. Or if you want to call us, you can call us and get the prostate booklet, which actually is our data versus other leading centers and they're compared in the same way. So you want to see what happens to men with PSA. Ten years out. Whatever, four to ten. There's ca- there's categories of that. You want to see what happens to men with PSAs ten to twenty. You want to see what happens to Gleason 7 patients. Ten. To, you want to see what Gleason 8, 9, 10, us versus the major centers. It's all in the book. It's a nice book. Yeah. The best is to come in for an appointment, and I spend an hour or two with the patient and their family going over the data, showing the data, and showing how it's important. It's really critical to know the data. 
Okay, no the data. So anyway, yes, there's uh, 200 plus thousand men with prostate cancer, and it's a leading cause of death. So don't think that prostate cancer is innocuous. It is not innocuous. Uh, I want to talk about a woman who flew in from Italy this week, because uh, sometimes we have the same problems overseas as in the U.S. of A. We had a 52-year-old woman flew in from Italy with a pancreas cancer. It was one and a half centimeters. Not too big. Not too big. It was resected. The lymph nodes were negative. She had chemotherapy in Italy, okay? So she did everything she was told. Correct. Now what happened? Okay, so she came in. She couldn't eat. Within one day, we staged her up. We made the diagnosis of what happened to her. Well, yeah, her cancer was resected. And within one year, despite the chemotherapy, she had gemcitabine, which is a usual chemotherapy given for people with pancreas cancer. The cancer grew back in the same spot. Same? The same spot. So where it's resected, and it grew back? Where it was operated on, removed, so-called removed. Do you call it removed when it grows back? Does that mean it was removed? No, it means it grew, it, it's still there. Maybe some of it was removed, okay? Maybe some of it was removed. Okay, she... At the time she was staged up, she was told that was her only set of cancer. It was resected in Italy. She had gemcitabine chemotherapy. A year later, she can't eat. She's doing poorly. So there's a pipe and something's obstructing it. There's a pipe obstructed, like our kitchen sink this week that was obstructed by ice in the lines. <laughs> she had cancer obstructing it. And what she had was the cancer grew back in the pancreas area where the surgeon operated. It was choking off the stomach. Her now stomach is the size of a two-liter bottle of whatever, Coca-Cola. So nothing can get out. Nothing can get out. So she puts food in. It has nowhere to go. It has nowhere to go, and she just vomits it out. So she has that, and she has a couple other sites of disease. We're going to treat her. And you've actually gone overseas and presented our data for pancreas, pancreas cancer. cancers, have you not? We ha- Yes, I have. Okay, so let's hear about pancreas cancer and radio surgery. Well, wh- where we aim the beam... You right. had about 87% control rate for the rest of the life, the life of, the of the patient. That means we can stop the cancer, shrink the cancer, or make it go away 87% of the time for the rest of the life of the patient. That's pretty good data. Yeah. I mean, here's, she had surgery. They removed it all, supposedly, and a year it, later it, it comes back. back and chokes off her stomach. And it wasn't just for pancreas cancer we looked at. We also looked at uh, metastatic pa- metastatics. Metastatic pancreas cancer. Okay, so it wasn't only for primary pancreas cancer. It was also for metastatic pancreas Correct. cancer, right? So we can treat the cancer in the primary site, which is mainly in the back of the abdomen. The metastatic site, the most common metastatic sites are the lymph nodes around the pancreas or the liver. The liver. So those are the sites, but actually not excluding other sites. Our success rate is very high. So for this woman, we will treat her. We're opening up her stomach now. We're trying to do it non-surgically, trying to get her quality of life. We don't understand really how she got sent to us in this poor condition, but we're working hard to get her taken care of in the best possible way and treat. And for other people with pancreas cancer, sometimes I had another patient this week with pancreas cancer, a young man, 48 years old, uh, he was actually told elsewhere that he had a cancer of the bile system. I spoke then to the gastroenterologist who looked inside. He was told he had a, the gastroenterologist thought he had a duodenal cancer. So two different diagnoses. Pancreas and, uh, duodenal and, and bile duct. Bile duct is different areas. Comes to us. We stage him up one day. That's it. One day. It's a PET scan. You, you see, make the, patient, well you see the patient. Up. See the patient. Stage him up. Actually, we found a cancer in the head of the pancreas and already spread to the liver. So what's the reason to treat him? I know chemo people say we have to have chemo, 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 and that's fine to have chemo. But we just heard another case. The patient had surgery and chemo. It didn't help her. And chemo often only works temporarily. It's not a permanent solution for many people, whereas radiosurgery, where we am the beam, has a much more durable effect. And the reason to treat this gentleman is to make sure that the mass in the pancreas shrinks down, doesn't cause problems, doesn't cause pain, doesn't cause suffering, doesn't cause obstruction. And radiosurgery is just five treatments. Each treatment is about 15 minutes. You come in, get a treatment, and go home. So the beauty is it's it's called radiosurgery, but it's not really surgery. It means that the radiation beam should act like the surgeon's knife. 
in stopping the cancer, but it does it without cutting it, without the crumbs, without anesthesia. There's no hospital stay. You just come in, lay down on our table and custom made equipment that's all made for you. And we can hit the cancer and usually hit it very, very, very successfully. So this woman from Italy, we say buongiorno. We say we hope you do well and we're fighting for your success. We're fighting every day for your success. So what do you say about that? I wish her the best. We wish her the best. Tanti agori. Tanti agori. Now, there's a new study out this week looking at smoking in healthcare professionals. And we've talked a lot about smoking costs you about 10 years of life. And a lot of symptoms come along with it. And a lot of symptoms, it's bad expensive. breath, it's expensive, uh, emphysema, heart disease. We talked about all the complications last week. Now, look at smoking among healthcare professionals. Okay, in healthcare professionals, the rate of smoking is eight percent. In the general population, it's about twice that. Smoking in healthcare professionals has fallen by twenty-three percent in ten years. So they know the the effects, the side effects. They probably see it more and understand it more. Uh, licensed practical nurses have the highest rate of smokers smoking. They're they have about a two-year education. They're smoking at a rate of about twenty percent. You know what the rate of smoking among physicians is? Four percent. Do you have any friends who smoke in medical school? Yeah, a couple. Really? Yeah. Why do they do that? I don't know. Boys or girls? Girls. Well, you know why girls smoke often? Why? To lose weight. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, physician smoking is 2.3%. Pretty 2. low. 2.3%. The general population in 2010 was 16%. That was a decline from 2003. A 14% decrease from 2003, 13% decrease from 2006. There were a survey of 3,000 healthcare professionals. 8% were current smokers. Actually, prevalence rate current is, for physicians is 1.95%. Pharmacists, 3%. Dental hygienists, 7%. Registered nurses, 7%. Respiratory therapists, who's should be seeing smokers, right? Eleven uh percent. -huh. Wow! And licensed practical nurse. <coughs> excuse me, twenty-five uh, percent. So actually, the more education, the less the smokers, uh, even among healthcare professionals. So it's telling you something that the people that see smokers, that take care of smokers, you see the effects of smoking. See and understand the effects of smoking. They have stopped smoking, and if you you're a smoker. You should, too. It's costing you 10 years of life. If you're 30 years old, you stop smoking today, you will live 10 years longer if you stop smoking today. It's a pretty good deal, right? I would like to have 10 more years of life just for not doing something that costs $15 a pack. Yes. Yeah. If you're 40 years old and you stop smoking today, you'll have nine more years of life. That's a lot. That's a lot. At any age, you will have more life if you Better stop quality of life. smoking today. And more importantly, and I know not many young people listen to this show because they're partying all night, but it's better not to smoke. Don't start smoking. Don't start smoking. It's better not to smoke. Okay, and we have proof of that. We have proof that you'll live longer. We're going to hear a word from our sponsor, the man with the golden voice, and then we'll be back to take your calls. We're at WABC Studios. We're at 1-800-848-9222, 800 848 9222. We're happy to uh, speak with you, take your calls, and send you a free informational booklet about our work and why we do it. For cancer treatment, most prefer effective, non-invasive, well-tolerated outpatient therapy. At Radio Surgery New York, the Radio Surgery Pioneers, that's our goal too. We're first in America, first in New York, first for you with body radio surgery. We hit your cancer from head to toe with no cutting, no bleeding. We have decades of experience with primary and metastatic, large or small cancers. Cancer treatment with possibly a second chance for you, even if chemo, radiation, or surgery didn't work or isn't tolerated. Our goals are the best results and quality of life. Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Lederman. For a free booklet and DVD, call 212 Choices. 212 Choices for a fresh second opinion. Most insurances, Medicare, Medicaid accepted. We're super convenient, Broadway and 38th in Manhattan. 
Hyperthermia 2. To hit your cancer, call 212 Choices. 212 Choices for Radio Surgery New York. For new or recurrent cancers, radio.